my former senior colleague, Dr. Vijay Wadner, uh, members of the Monetary Board, senior deputy governor, deputy governors, assistant governors, uh, senior director, directors, uh, colleagues, bank CEOs, ladies and gentlemen. Clearly, the 28th of August is a landmark uh, in the history uh, of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Uh, it was on this day, 68 years ago, as Nishadi has just told us, that the Central Bank uh, came into existence with John Exter as its first governor. <clears throat> and it is a special day for central bankers, both present and past. And in this context, it's a real privilege, an honor, in fact, uh, to welcome back to the Central Bank, one of its most illustrious alumni, as I said, my former senior colleague, uh, Dr. Vijay Wardner. Before I introduce our distinguished orator for this afternoon, uh, I'd like to take a few minutes uh, to talk a little bit about what's been happening over the last year uh, since we last had this oration in 2017. Um, there are many positive things that have happened, uh, but we've also had our challenges. So I'll get over the negative part of it to start with. Uh, I think it's no secret that we've had some legacy issues that we've had to tackle, and that has taken time. It has taken staff resources, it's taken financial resources, and at times it has been distracting. So. Though that process is still going on, there are various inquiries, there are six um, forensic audits, uh, all this has to be done, and we need to get through all of them. Uh, we've made good progress, uh, and we are determined to stay on course to complete all that work, because clearly those have to uh, be completed, and we need to move beyond that. But <clears throat> why I um, think that the staff, the senior management and staff of the central bank uh, deserve a special commendation is that despite some of these challenges uh, which have taken up time, we have been able to get a great deal done. Uh, if one looks right across the spectrum in terms of the central bank's work, uh, there are important initiatives um, and significant progress has been made during the course of this year. Arguably, the flagship initiative is the introduction of the flexible inflation target team regime and the amendment of the Monetary Law Act to accommodate such a um, monetary policy formulation regime. We've made progress, very satisfactory progress, uh, and we feel we're on track to have a fully fledged uh, inflation targeting regime, a flexible inflation targeting regime uh, by the end of the first quarter of next year. Of course, all these things need political blessing, but we've got cabinet approval for the broad framework, and we're optimistic that we'll be able to complete this work on time. The senior deputy governor <coughs> has been taking a leadership role in this, and we are making good progress, as I said. And that, I think, will be a landmark achievement in terms of taking us onto a, a, a plane uh, which uh, will enable us to have a much more forward-looking, proactive monetary policy uh, which is focused on anchoring expectations. And also we will be, put in place, we will be putting in place a legal framework uh, which, will, uh, not, which will make it not possible uh, to have fiscal forbearance. So that's uh, clearly something that has to be done uh, when Sri Lanka is now a country that is exposed to rating agencies and international capital markets. We need to have this kind of architecture to ensure that we have stability and the macroeconomic fundamentals that we require. So good progress is being made. Um, <clears throat> on the um, financial system stability front, uh, the banks are in pretty good shape. Uh, a bit of an uptick in NPLs as the economy has slowed down. But by and large, um, the metrics are all sound. 
and good progress is being made in terms of implementing the Basel III standards and IFRS 9. In fact, as far as the Basel III standards are concerned, uh, I think I'm right in saying that Sri Lanka is well ahead of many of its peers in terms of uh, what we have been able to achieve so far. We've had greater challenges as far as the non-bank financial institution sector is concerned, but here again, uh, tangible progress is being made. Uh, Deputy Governor Sirivodna and his team, uh, particularly colleagues in the uh, uh, Department for the Supervision of uh, Non-Bank uh, Financial Institutions, and the newly created uh, Resolution and Enforcement Department have been working very hard to address some of the legacy issues that we've had. Uh, we've had uh, half a dozen uh, insolvent institutions, which have been a kind of an overhang that has constrained the work in terms of the financial system stability uh, cluster, but we are now slowly uh, making progress. Um, uh, I think you probably would have seen in the press uh, that we are um, resolving these slowly, one by one. And in fact, yesterday was the very first time that we were able to pay some depositors from CIFL out of the deposit insurance scheme. So that was, a, again, a, a landmark occasion in the sense that we are now using the full armory at the central bank's disposal uh, to ensure that we address the legacy issues and then to put that sector on a more uh, stable footing. Here again, progress has been satisfactory, but there is much more to do. Um, on the, um, uh, in terms of our agency functions, uh, on the issuance of uh, public debt, uh, as well as the management of it, uh, important initiatives have been taken. There is a new auction system in place now, and it's pretty well embedded and working well. Uh, we've had greater transparency introduced through the uh, Bloomberg platform, uh, and the auction rules and the processes that we've introduced have all, have all contributed to a more transparent uh, and <clears throat> effective system of uh, public debt issuance. On the debt management side, uh, the passage of the uh, Active Liability Management Act has given uh, the Treasury and the Central Bank uh, greater flexibility and headroom to manage the overhang, the considerable overhang of public debt that has to be managed. And we are confident that provided uh, the country is able to maintain its fiscal consolidation trajectory, uh, we would be able to manage the a rather onerous a debt burden. On uh, the um, other important agency function, the EPF, again, a lot of work has been done in terms of improving processes and procedures. Uh, the um, investment committee now meets on a daily basis. Uh, new investment guidelines, investment and trading guidelines uh, have been developed. Uh, CCTV cameras and voice recording uh, have been put in place. Uh, the uh, segregation between the front, middle, and back office uh, has uh, been uh, made more entrenched. Um, and we are working towards, uh, and I think recently the EPF started operating in the secondary market in government securities, and we are working towards the EPF coming back into the stock market. Uh, fairly soon, once all the preparatory work is completed. So both in terms of our core functions of uh, uh, price and economic stability and financial system, uh, financial system stability, as well as in terms of our uh, agency functions, a great deal of work has been going on. And I should also mention that we've uh, put in place a um, uh, enterprise-wide uh, risk management framework and we are getting the oversight uh, structures in place uh, at the three levels uh, of defense as far as risk management is concerned. The macroprudential surveillance department 
is doing uh, more and more work. We've got a better flow of data now uh, coming to support that work. And the currency department is moving ahead with the clean note policy. Um, the, re uh, the regional development department is involved not just in its own credit programs, but it's also helping the government to implement some of the new uh, credit initiatives uh, that you have seen uh, in recent times. Uh, the Department of Foreign Exchange has had the challenge of uh, adjusting to the new uh, Foreign Exchange Act, uh, which has brought about considerable changes. It is required that there is considerable awareness raising, both amongst financial institutions and the public generally, and uh, progress is being made in terms of getting the new act embedded. Uh, we've found a number of challenges that need to be addressed, and we hope to raise, that, raise those with the government uh, to get them addressed fairly quickly. Um, the, um, the Payments and Settlements Department has been doing a great deal of work. As you know, there's exponential change that's taking place uh, in this area. The challenge for the regulator is to balance innovation and the introduction of disruptive technology with stability. Uh, and in order to help us navigate this challenge, uh, the Payments and Settlements Department set up two committees, one on FinTech, the other on blockchain. Those committees have now uh, completed their work and the department is quietly working its way through in terms of introducing uh, the uh, changes that are necessary. There is a regulatory sandbox that has also been put in place so that people can experiment and help us to move forward as far as uh, reg tech, as people call it, as far as getting in place a regulatory framework which will um, promote and facilitate new technologies while maintaining stability. <clears throat> the, um, uh, I should, I can't go uh, um, end my remarks without thanking all the colleagues in the support services department. The HR department, which is in fact working on a new HR strategy. Uh, the IT department, without whom we can't do most of our work. Uh, the finance department, uh, crucial again, the secretariat, facilities management, uh, all these departments, uh, clearly without their assistance on a day-to-day -day basis, and the work of the central bank can't go on. So I hope I've been able to convince those of you who have come from outside the central bank uh, that there is a great deal uh, that is going on in the central bank. Much of it very much in the right direction. And we do feel uh, we are making progress. Uh, it's, much of it is still a work in progress, so we need to press on, we need to remain focused, but uh, I think we are going forward. Now, let me now turn to the great pleasure, uh, the most pleasurable uh, task that I have, uh, which is uh, to introduce uh, our orator today. I think many of you know Dr. Vidyavardhana personally, um, when I first joined the Central Bank in 1974, I believe he was an economist in the Money and Banking uh, Division of the Research Department. And from that time onwards, he's had a stellar career in the Central Bank. Served the Central Bank for some 35 years. Served the Central Bank as a Deputy Governor for nine years. I do not think anybody else has had such a tenure. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very distinguished, illustrious, and stellar career that Mr. Uh, Dr. Vijay Wardner has had at the Central Bank. Uh, and he has not rested on his laurels uh, once he finished here in, in 2009, I believe. He has, he's actually the, the, the heartbeat of the uh, Business Management School, which is an extremely successful collaboration with Northumbria University, which is giving young Sri Lankans an opportunity to get uh, internationally recognized accreditation. Uh, those of you who know Dr. Vijay Wardner would know uh, he is a man who is committed to technical excellence, uh, but that technical assistance, technical uh, excellence is not the only thing that marks him apart. 
he's had a fierce, fierce commitment to uh, integrity, uh, to independence, uh, and he has always charted a uh, path uh, in terms of what he felt was right. Uh, this is something that is to his great credit, and it's something that he has uh, held dear right through his long and distinguished career. Uh, since then, I should also say that he, uh, you know, as part of his CV, he was also the founder general manager of the CRIB. Uh, he, has, he was a long-term uh, chairman of the Institute of Bankers. Uh, and as I said, he's now set up the business management school. And of course, he is a highly respected commentator on current affairs as a writer, columnist, uh, as a, a media personality. Uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Wardner has been very generous in giving his time uh, to help the public at large to understand better some of the complex issues of our time. And this is one of his great attributes. He is able to explain complex concepts and com concept issues in simple terms. And he's always been a very generous uh, in terms of giving his time to mentoring colleagues. I'm sure a number of you have benefited over the years. So it is with great, great pleasure that I invite Dr. W.A. Vijay Wardner to deliver the CBSL oration 2018. Thank you. Thanks, Governor, for the very kind introduction. Madonna, the pop singer, who played the main role in uh, as Eva Peron in Evita, she sang a very famous song, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. The truth is, I never left you. After many years, in fact 13 years, she visited Argentina again and she was received with an overwhelming reception by Argentinians. And she again said, it is good to be back after 13 years. I might say, it is good to be back after nine years. In fact, um, I also can say I never left the central bank, like Madonna. And I, not in that sense, no central banker can leave the central bank because central bank is connected to their life so dearly. Even after they leave the central bank, day and night, they live within the central bank. Therefore, we can say, once a central banker is a, always a central banker. Central Bank is celebrating 68 years of existence today. After leaving the Central Bank, I had the opportunity of having discussions about the Central Bank with many people outside the Central Bank. I have to admit that the bank is considered in high esteem in Sri Lanka's contemporary society. And one fact that proves it is that whenever I teach students at the university, I ask one question them, what do you want to do after you graduate from the university? And all of them want to join the central bank. The reason I, when I ask why, according to them, central bank is the leader, leader of economic thought, leader of the financial system, a leader of many more. And as a result, all these young undergraduates at universities, without exception, want to jump the bandwagon of what is known as this leader in the country. And they want to be a part of that leadership. It's not very unusual ambition because even when I passed out from the university, some say 50 years ago, the, our ambition was actually 
either to join the academia at a university or join the central bank. And any other career was looked for only if these two could not be worked out. I was a lecturer at the university drawing a higher salary than the initial salary of a staff office of the central bank, but still I left that lucrative job at that time and joined the central bank. In hindsight, I can say I have made a very prudent decision. And I am who I am today and what I am today is not because of anything. Because I had the opportunity of working under seven governors, many senior central bankers who are very illustrious central bankers and also the current governor, Dr. Indrajit Kumarasamy. And when I told the uh, late governor, Mr. S. Javadana, about this, he immediately corrected me. He said, don't say that you have work under them, say that you have work with them. His point is that governor and the senior officers are simply co-workers in an intellectual society. And there are no hierarchies in the intellectual world because you are rated not by your seniority, but by the wisdom that you might demonstrate everything that you do in your life as well as in your professional career. So therefore, it is good to return to this intellectual community once again, even after nine years. The central banks have been the main target of criticism by many because according to the understanding of people outside, central banks have failed to deliver what they are supposed to deliver to the members of the public. If you look at the past history of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, we know that the Central Bank of Sri Lanka had to go through many periods of disturbances, volatility, but still the bank has managed to stand as one of the unique institutions in the country. So therefore, I congratulate uh, Governor Kumarasamy and his senior management for continuing with that good practice and also the present monetary board for taking central bank forward as the governor has uh, just mentioned to us. In an intellectual society, the most important thing that we have to do is that the wisdom that we demonstrate in our writing, in our presentations, in our speeches, they should have three qualities. They should be unbiased, they should be objective, and they should be impartial. And this was the piece of wisdom given to central bank officers by one of the leftist ministers of finance, Dr. N.M. Perra, in 1971, when he met the central bank officers in a private function. I will quote what Dr. N.M. Perra had said. He said that uh, central bank should make independent reports on economic subjects to the government and not report merely to suit the political complexion of the government in power, which is a very important thing. He would, the minister would value reports of the bank made dispassionately and objectively. The two important words presented by this leftist minister of finance is you must be dispassionate and you must be objective. The dispassionateness and the objectivity come from independent minds. Independent minds are nurtured by independent culture. Independent culture is being established by independent institutions. Hence, it is of so much 
importance to us in the central bank to make the central bank an independent institution, breed independence culture here, and also develop independent minds. And if we have done so, we would be able to serve the nation more effectively, more cogently, and more efficiently. The central bank people, therefore, have to play a special game. The game is the bank has only one power, though many outside the central bank think that the central bank has so many powers, we have only one power, that power is to print money. And printing money is a very easy exercise for the central bank. If somebody asks Governor Kumarasamy to okay, deliver me one truckload of Sri Lanka rupees, 5,000 rupee notes, all he has to do is to go down to the vault, open it, take out sufficient 5,000 notes, put it into a truck and deliver it to someone. Because it's just like a magician who produces a rabbit by just waving a magic wand, the central bank can print money. And that is the, defi the defect and the deficiency of the central bank also, because it can print money as it wishes. And as a result, all central bankers are required to play this game very prudently without causing any side consequences for the rest of us in the economy. We people who are the citizens of the country, we accept the money printed by the central bank only on trust. Because that is the trust that we have. Uh, and the trust is the one which would persuade us to accept it. The trust is, hmm, when a 5,000 rupee note is delivered to us by the central bank, the bank promises that when we go to the market, we can buy a basket of goods and services worth of 5,000 rupees. And if we cannot do that, then of course the central bank has breached its trust. So the mandate given to the central bank by parliament is to use this trust responsibly and also to facilitate the economy to conduct its own transactions. When the economy produces real goods and services, there must be a backing by money which would in fact support the economy to exchange those goods and services. So as a result, though many people outside the central bank think that money printing is a sinful activity, it is not a sinful activity. Money is needed. Without money, no economy can function. In fact, um, the very recently, the, uh, the Oxford historian, Yuval Noah Harari, in his um, Sapiens, The Brief History of Humankind, he has said, it's only one thing that has been able to unite all the people in the world, not the religion, not empires, and not any other thing. That is money. North Koreans may be hating Americans, but still they love the US dollar. And that is the way the money has united the whole world. So in that sense, if the central bank functions responsibly to produce the money that the mandate it has been given by parliament, we have trust in the central bank, and thus that trust will go a long way when it comes to believing in the central bank. So therefore, what the central bank management should do in order to earn the trust of the people is nothing but to use their extraordinary power of creating money responsibly in the economy. And for that purpose, central banks in the world have been given independence by parliament, not by politicians, but by parliament. Because the central bank has been created by us, by people like us, the community, society. And society wants the central bank to be independent and be independent of the people who can influence the decision-making process in the, in the central bank.
And for that purpose, if any politician wants to interfere in the work of the central bank, the best thing he has to do is to, he can go back to parliament, renegotiate with parliamentarians, renegotiate with society, and ask for his powers to intervene in the central bank's work. Without getting that power from the legislature, no one can or no one should intervene in the work of a central bank in any part of the world today. Central bank's uh, independence has been um, a, a crucial issue throughout history. Because the banks, as I mentioned, have the power of creating wealth, financial wealth, and that wealth is nothing but our ability to use that wealth to buy real goods and services. And as a result, central bank is at the envy of all other people in a society because no other institution can command this kind of a power. So the um, world's um, oldest central bank, Sweden's uh, Sveriges Riks Bank, that was set up in 1668. It was set up by Swedish parliament specifically because they wanted to control the powers of the Swedish king. And that bank, during the first 100 years of existence, it actually demonstrated a significant power over the monarch. But uh, some unfortunate thing happened in 1788 when uh, King Gustav III of Sweden demanded the central bank to print krona, the money currency of uh, Sweden, so that he can wage war with Russia. Like a good central bank, the Swedish uh, central bank refused. But the king didn't take no as an answer. What he did was he got his own Swedish public debt office to print another currency note, which was uh, competitively, which was circulating along with the krona produced by the Swedish Riks Bank. For about, say, 20 years, till 1802, Central Bank of Sweden was driven to backwater because it was the king's currency that was circulated, but like a good king or bad king, he was defeated in the war. Sweden was defeated by its uh, neighboring nations. And as a result, it was proved once again it is a highly risky job to get a central bank to print money and invade your neighboring countries. And since then, the independence of the of central bank has been one of the most discussed issues in the central banking literature. A good example is found when John Maynard Keynes, the most influential economist of the 20th century, when he was serving in the India office in uh, London, he was appointed as a member of the Chamberlain Commission that was appointed by, the, by Her Majesty's government to look into the financial system of India and make recommendations for the establishment of a central bank. Since the members of the commission didn't have any knowledge about a central bank and Keynes was asked to write, prepare a special report and forward it to the other members. And in that report, Keynes had suggested to set up a shareholder owning bank under the title of Imperial Bank of India as the central bank of India by amalgamating the three uh, presidency banks that had been operating at that time in Mumbai, Calcutta, and Chennai, which were which became later became the state banks of India. Unfortunately for Keynes, because he suggested that even though the uh, colonial secretary was behind the establishment of this bank as a as the person who has promoted it, he said he should not intervene in the day-to-day -day affairs of the 
they do affairs of the uh, new imperial bank mm. thank you new imperial bank also he said it should be free from the government and also it should be free from the shareholders if you look at the modern central bank which is wholly owned by the government what keynes suggested was the central bank to be set up should be free from the government it should be independent from the government at least as far as the day to day uh, operations are concerned but because of the um, onset of the first world war the royal government could not go ahead with the proposal made by keynes in 1935 the reserve bank of india was set up as a shareholder owning bank and it functioned as an independent central bank till 1949 when it was nationalized by the newly independent government of india since then there are criticisms against the reserve bank of india that it has actually functioned as a branch of the ministry of finance of the government of union government of india and the governor rangarajan had to demand that the central reserve bank of india should be should be given great autonomy in 1993 when he addressed a seminar in mumbai about the independence of the reserve bank of india and also all all central banks throughout the world one good indication is the uh, the statement made by the former governor of the reserve bank of india y v reddy when he addressed a conference in chennai in december 2017 he said the central bank is a creation of the government and therefore it cannot be free from its creator and therefore it's we cannot talk about the independence of a central bank earlier when he addressed another seminar in hyderabad he recalled um, that 2008 when he was functioning as the governor a journalist had asked him a question at a press conference whether the governor of the reserve bank of india was independent he recalled the answer he gave he said the governor of the reserve bank of india is very independent i have the permission of my minister of finance to say this that the 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 way that the central banks are operating we have to always look at the about the central bank there's a sovereign government we'll have to always keep it in our mind and this factor was very well understood by the architect of central bank of sri lanka joe nexter who was the first governor of the central bank of ceylon in the extra report extra has said that he is bringing the secretary permanent secretary to ministry of finance at that time not the secretary permanent secretary as a vote carrying member of the central bank monetary board in order to create a conduit between the central bank and the government because the permanent secretary ministry of finance was expected to convey the wishes of the minister of finance and so that the wishes of the government to central bank so that central bank would make its decisions independently by taking into account what the government wishes and this was one of the areas where the uh, where john extra had been criticized because uh, uh, to make the secret the ministry of finance permanent secretary minister of finance as a vote carrying member of the monetary board but he has a good reason the reason is that the central bank cannot function independently of the government as uh, governor reddy has said it cannot be independent of its creator because subsequent parliaments can always amend the monetary law act and take out the central bank's uh, independence because of this reason 
extra expected since the permanent secretary would serve longer than the political minister of finance he would be able to give good wisdom to the minister so that the minister will not interfere in the works of the central bank and also he expected that the independence of the central bank will be preserved with the maturity of the people who run the ministry of finance and who run the central bank and by building up the necessary conventions where they would start respecting each other but unfortunately for us in the 1972 republican constitution we have scrapped the post of the permanent secretary to a minister ministry he said we have now secretaries who are appointed by the cabinet of ministers who have to serve the minister who have appointed them and therefore as john exter expected the present minister of finance is not an independent person because he has to serve his own minister more than he is serving the nation or the central bank so there's a kind of a conflict in the present monetary board itself because the secretary to ministry of finance as john next expected is no longer an independent person he is appointed by the cabinet of ministers he is removed by the cabinet of ministers whenever the minister changes his job also changes so as a result the post of the secretary to ministry of finance goes along with the political cycle rather than any other administration cycle because of the reason we have a serious problem today but of course um, what extra expected was that uh, the development of a good culture good convention and the majority of the people who hold these positions would be able to iron out differences prevent continuous battling between them of course those are all uh, friendly battles and they would be able to work for the nation that is because central bank is an outfit created by the nation and not by politicians we have to remember this the what is most important here is therefore the maturity of the central bankers and central bankers should be able to say no whenever the rest of the world is asking them to say yes if central bank governor and the monetary board members have the ability to say no even though what they say is not very popular among the people that central bank is serving the nation more than a central bank which should be serving others but the uh, modern literature on central banking has identified four types of central bankers hawks dows swingers and pigeons and if you look at the central bankers who are present here you may be able to identify them also who is a hawk who is a pigeon who is a swinger who is a dow a hawk is a person in central bank's terminology who believes that the central bank's power should not be abused central bank should not print money more than necessary and central bank will have to follow its own independent monetary policy a dow is in the opposite the dow believes that central bank's power should be used to promote the economy by printing more money in other words a dow is a person who canvasses for the stimulating packages canvasses for the active monetary policy which is known as the monetary activism 
And by doing that, a DAO thinks that the country can be uh, promoted economically. But of course, this is a serious misconception. Because throughout the history, whenever central banks try to do this, whole central banks have failed. In fact, the, uh, the best country that we always quote as an example is Singapore. Its first finance minister, Dr. Gokensvi, he, in 1992, he had recalled why Singapore decided to set up a currency board instead of a central bank, even though the currency board was a relic of the colonial rulers. The reason was the currency board introduced a discipline to printing money because you cannot print money unless you have equivalent amount of foreign assets in the currency board. Sri Lanka also had a currency board before we established Central Bank of Sri Lanka and we went for the central bank, not for currency board. And um, Dr. Gorkin Sui has explained why the Singaporean authorities, who are known as the old guards, chose for the continuation of the currency board instead of a central bank. The reason is, he says, they didn't believe that the central bank created money can deliver prosperity to people. Prosperity comes, according to the beliefs of this old guard in Singapore, through hard work. Hard work has to be demonstrated by students at schools, undergraduates at universities, and workers at workplaces in a competitive manner. And he has said by having that kind of a policy, the Singapore wanted to deliver three messages. One to their politicians, second one to their own citizens, third one to the people in the rest of the world. They are politicians, the message is if you want to incur vote-catching expenditure programs to win elections, you must bring money from your home, not the money printed by the central bank. Their own citizens is, if you want better public services, you must be prepared to pay for them. There is no such thing as a free lunch. The difference between us and Singaporeans, we still believe that there is a free lunch. For everything that comes, we think there is a free lunch without knowing that the free lunch has to be financed by ourselves. The third message was to the people in the rest of the world. He said, we are actually inviting the people in the rest of the world to leave their savings with us. We will not only use those savings prudently, but also we will ensure that we will repay whatever you have left us with an attractive rate of return. And that's the difference uh, between, the, uh, between the ideology of the uh, politicians in Sri Lanka at the time of independence and the ideology of the politicians in Singapore. And one reason maybe I have even uh, written about it earlier. The first minister of finance, uh, the former president, Jaya Javadana, his biographers, KMD Silva and Howard Diggins, they have documented that in 1942, J.R. Javadana had read the book written by John Maynard Keynes, The General Theory. And immediately, according to the biographers, J.R. Javadana had become a fan of John Maynard Keynes. And therefore, probably he would have been uh, influenced by the Keynesian thinking at that time that if you have a central bank which can accommodate the financial requirements of the government, would be for the betterment of this newly independent nation called Ceylon. But uh, even John Exeter, in his Exeter report, has warned about it. He has said, if you try to use the central bank's printing power to finance the expenditure programs of the government, 
in a small open economy you run the risk of hmm, allowing all the money that you create inside your country leaking out by way of imports to the country the result would be you have deficit in your balance of payments you will run down your foreign exchange reserves and finally you have the pressure for your exchange rate to depreciate so this was a wisdom that even joe next had said the warning had been given to anyone who would try to use the central bank printed money to have this monetary activism which the dows have been advocating then uh, we have singers singers are people who move from one end to the other end just like a little child who is singing uh, moving very freely from one side to the other on one occasion he is a monetary activist on the other occasion he is simply resistant to monetary activism he is a pure monetary economist the latest addition has been pigeons who are peacemakers whenever there is a demand from the government the central banker will go to the government and try to make peace by offering maybe half of what the government wants not full but at least they try to uh, maintain the central bank independence so this is the uh, crucial issue now because uh, we find that uh, the governor aguram rajan was a monetary hawk he couldn't survive in the in india and as a result he had to leave within the matter of three year time period so there's a risk faced by the uh, hawkish central bankers again there's a risk faced by the davis central bankers swingers might play the game according to their own requirements and finally it is the pigeons who might rescue the central bank from adverse repercussions that might come from the politicians so what we have to keep in our mind is therefore the central bank's independence is good it's a must but at the same time we must remember there is a government which is sovereign government which is above us and that sovereign government can at any time take our independence away and if it decides to do that who is going to help us there is no one who is going to help us that is because the literature on central banking says there are three groups which want the central bank to compromise its independence the first group is politicians they want to compromise the central bank's independence because in order to win the elections they want the central bank to maintain low interest rates they want the central bank to create more credit and they want to have an easy money policy so that the people have enough liquidity and they might vote at the elections the second group which want the central bank to compromise independence is the power groups in the market the power groups in the market are also very 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 powerful they want the central bank to continue with easy lending for maybe specified areas like real estate low the interest rate even though the country has to increase the interest rates to provide various kinds of subsidies through central banking action so that they can benefit out of that and that group work in silently without the knowledge of anyone is more powerful in the world than the politician because whenever a politician opens his mouth we hear him we see him but when the powerful group in the market captures the central bank which is known in literature as the regulatory capture today is not seen by anyone it happens behind the scene and the third group is present here the employees of the central bank they also want the best compensation package the highest compensation package so that they can be the best employees in the country and that is another powerful group and that to 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 please that powerful group 
uh, it's very difficult for a central bank management to function as an independent institution with with some prudent monetary policy packages. And um, that powerful group is also a group which should not be uh, disappointed, annoyed, and as a result, there's a good reason to keep them happy. And um, in the case of the uh, central bank in the past, whenever the salary negotiations were made, I can recall, I have actually headed several salary negotiations when I was the deputy governor. The, the two parties are on two sides. The central bank employees have an inflation projection of about, say, 100%. <laughs> they want the salaries to be increased by 200%. The central bank management has a very moderate inflation projection, say, 5 or 6%, and they might accommodate 2%. So it's a very uh, tedious negotiation, and finally we agree on a certain one. But of course, the literature says the monetary board has to be mindful of politicians, mindful of the power groups, and it also should be mindful of the people inside the central bank who want to compromise the central bank's independence. These are some of the things that we find uh, in the literature. And um, now, there are new areas where we find the central bank's independence has been at the uh, focus of attention by many people in the country. One area is that the central banks today have expanded their work beyond the traditional central banking function of maintaining price stability in their countries. The governor lists out uh, so many additional functions the Central Bank of Sri Lanka is now handling. And most of these functions require the Central Bank to get the political support in order to implement them. Good example is the financial system stability. In the case of the financial system stability, a, a hawkish Central Banker might say, we should not allow any financial institution which is ill-performing to perform, to function. We must weed it out, just like we weed out the weeds in our garden. But of course today, the functions of the central bank has been the micro-prudential financial system stability and also the macro-prudential financial system stability. In the case of macro prudential, the central bank might be able to say we are not worried about the individual institutions, we are worried about the financial system, we have maintained the stability of the financial system, as so therefore we have done our job. But what matters today is the micro prudential one. In the micro prudential one, there are always these financial institutions which are too big to be allowed to collapse. And as a result, they have to be rescued. To rescue them, when it comes to rescuing those institutions, you have to provide liquidity as well as you have to provide capital. Central bank can provide liquidity under its liquidity window, it can provide, but it cannot provide capital. If there's a necessity to provide capital, the capital should come from taxpayers. So therefore, a cordial relationship with the government is a must. Without that, we cannot maintain the financial system stability. Then comes the financial system which are too small and therefore we can allow in today's socio-political and culture, even the smallest financial institution, we cannot allow it to collapse. The reason is those people are numerous, the number of depositors may run into hundreds and thousands. And if anyone comes in front of the central bank, set himself on fire, it's a bad reputation for the central bank. And therefore, you can't allow even the small financial institution to collapse. But then how do you rescue them? For you to rescue them, you have to invite the government oversight. So as a result, 
it's an area where the central bank has to compromise its independence. In, when conducting monetary policy, it may be independent. But when it conducts the financial system stability policy, which has been part of the mandate of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, and also the mandate of many central banks in the world, government oversight is a must. And there you have to compromise. So it's a kind of a give and take exercise. And if you want to get the government support, you may have to allow the government to get support to your monetary policy also. So it's a kind of a uh, compromising situation for central bank. The second situation arises about the reputation of the central bank. The reputation arises because of the frauds uh, that may arise in a central bank. And it's very important that the central bank should and the monetary board should take a very serious note of the financial irregularities that might occur inside the central banks. If the monetary board allows them to pester, the wound will become, uh, it will lead to a situation where you will have to cut a limb or cut uh, the whole body in order to save the person. And there are many instances where these things have happened in the recent past. And you may have read the central bank governor of Latvia who was arrested for accepting a bribe. Governor of the central bank of Afghanistan had to flee the country because he had got a bribe from one of the banks. And also the, uh, the governor of the Magna Cara Malaysia has to step down because he was accused of uh, working with the previous administration in Malaysia in supporting the uh, money laundering exercise. And even in our case, there are reports that the former governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, when he was asked to appear before the CID to give a statement, he has absconded. Now, these things are very serious matters for the reputation of a central bank. And when the reputation is at a very low level, the Threat is that when other people like politicians who intervene in the independence of central bank, the central bank is unable to get the support of the civil society. But there is no any other way that we can control the politicians unless we exercise pressure through civil society. But if the central bank doesn't have a clean record, it's very difficult for the central bank to get the support of the civil society, because civil society always views the central bank as an institution which is again a, a, an institution which is filled with fraud and filled with all other things. But um, of course, we have to recognize the fact that hmm, the type of fraudulent activities that might happen cannot be predicted or identified ex ante. They would happen, they would be detected only after they have happened, which is called exposed. So what the central bank should do is, whenever that kind of a thing has been exposed, it has to immediately take measures to remedy it and do a damage control exercise to maintain the reputation of the central bank. Because the um, central bank is functioning in society. We have been created by society. And if we don't get the support of the civil society, we cannot function independently. Whenever uh, politicians uh, accuse the central bank senior officers, there was a reason, there was an instance where a former minister of finance openly accusing a senior officer of the central bank, saying that he has been responsible for the downfall of the Sri Lanka rupee in the market. And we saw the governor Indrajit Kumar Aswami had to issue a uh, clarification in order to allay the uh, fears and the suspicions that have been created in the uh, minds of the people. But nobody in the civil society supported the central bank, even though the central bank is supposed to maintain the value of the assets that they are holding. I didn't see any newspaper editorial criticizing the action done by the particular uh, politician in question. That is because we have not been able to communicate effectively that we are for the civil society and therefore civil society has to serve us also.
So it's a two-way relationship between the two. The third uh, instance comes because the governor also mentioned the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, quite correctly, has now moved into flexible inflation targeting system. In the case of the inflation targeting, everybody knows that the central bank would directly control the rate of inflation rather than the intermediate uh, the instrument called the money supply. But to control inflation directly, central bank should have complete freedom to set the interest rates. To set the interest rate, there should be a statutorily central bank will have to be given powers by parliament, not by politicians, by parliament that central banks should have the freedom to set interest. Now fortunately for us, the present government in its vision 2025 has accepted that the central bank of Sri Lanka should introduce the flexible inflation targeting as its monetary policy platform. And the government has pledged that it would introduce the necessary regulations and also amend the Montreal Act to facilitate the central bank to do that. So in that exercise, probably we may be able to maintain the independence of the central bank in a proper sense. Then, of course, we have the issue. When you give too much of powers to anyone, there's a tendency that the power can be abused also. And when we make the central bank independent, we run the risk of creating a monster who cannot be controlled by others. Therefore, it is always necessary that the independence should be accompanied by accountability. Without accountability, if you give independence to a central bank, It's not a reflection on the current governor or the monetary board, but in future we might have a situation where we have a monster heading the central bank. If it happens, there is no way for civil society to control it. So the, what, how other countries have done this is that they have got the central bank to explain its views. Like in USA, the congressional committees, there are parliamentary committees which have to be supported by experts because parliamentarians are not good monetary economists. They should be supported by experts, and central bank must be called before those committees every quarter and explain the situation of the country, explain why a particular monetary policy action has been taken by the central bank, and how the country would benefit out of those monetary policy measures. So it's therefore a good way that we should when we amend the Montreal Act, we must make the central bank more accountable and more transparent. I might add another important thing to the appointment of the governor and the Montreal board members. Today, it is done exclusively at the discretion of the president and the minister of finance. But other countries, even uh, if you take a new central bank like uh, Nepal Rastra Bank, uh, there is a long selection process. In Bank of Canada, the selection of the next governor starts at least one year before the incumbent governor retires. They have a procedure where the governor is, uh, uh, the, where people can nominate uh, suitable persons for the post of governor that there are a series of interviews with the uh, nominated people. And finally, three names are suggested to the appointing authority, that's the Governor General of Canada, to select one person as the governor. And the name is announced at least six months before the incumbent governor retires. It allows the newly nominated governor to familiarize himself with central banking, be a partner of the central bank, and take over the job. But unfortunately, in Sri Lanka, this doesn't happen. Even in uh, neighboring India, uh, we find that uh, the, the, when Raghuram Rajan uh, expressed his desire not to be reappointed, uh, selection process 
took place at least two weeks before the uh, new governor took COVID's office. And uh, according to reports, there were eight candidates who had been uh, screened by Prime Minister Modi himself with his senior cabinet colleagues before the new uh, governor party had been appointed. Another important thing is the expenditure of the uh, senior officers of the central bank. That should be transparent. That is because, as I mentioned earlier, if we want to spend money, it's a matter of just going down to the vault, opening the vault, taking money out. So Bank of Canada has a very important procedure there. Whenever governor, board members, and senior officers travel abroad, entertain outsiders, they have to disclose it in their website. So if you go to Bank of Canada website, you can find, uh, but there are hilarious things. All the governor has entertained somebody for lunch by spending about, say, 20 Canadian dollars. But that is the way that the uh, central bank has made itself transparent so that people will trust the central bank. Now, those are small issues compared to the large issue. Today, there is a much more pressing problem for any central banker, which has arisen in the form of alternative currencies called cryptocurrencies. And we find the proliferation of cryptocurrencies and economy is a serious threat to the independence of a central bank, not coming from politicians, not coming from the power groups, not coming from the employees, but coming exactly from nowhere, we don't know, from the cloud, maybe. And those currencies are competing with the currencies issued by central banks. And there's no way for central banks to win the game because it, now it has been proved that the currency that we issue, rupees and cents, is a very primitive way of doing transactions, when it comes to doing transactions by using cryptocurrency. So most of the central banks, like Bank of England, uh, Suryas Ricks Bank, uh, they have now, they are considering the introduction of their own uh, cryptocurrency to uh, go along with the side by side with the, uh, the physical currency that they produce. The best example comes from, uh, the, from uh, Venezuela and Iran, in Venezuela, two weeks ago, they introduced their own cryptocurrency called Petro because they could not do uh, manage with the existing currency Bolivar because the exchange rate uh, between US dollar and Bolivar had fallen within a matter of three years from 25 Bolivar to US dollar to 6.5 million Bolivar to US dollar. So five digits of Bolivar was taken out just by one thing. And they introduce a new currency called Petro. Iran is also going to introduce a new currency. And the best example comes from our neighboring Reserve Bank of India. Today they have announced Reserve Bank of India has set up a special cryptocurrency research unit. The mandate, number one, to consider issuing its own cryptocurrency. Number two, regulate all other cryptocurrencies to be issued. Third one is how to cope with the artificial intelligence that is be developing and how we would be able to uh, introduce artificial intelligence to the banking sector. And one suggestion for India is that their cryptocurrency should be called Lakshmi coin. The Lakshmi is the goddess of prosperity. If Governor Indrajit Kumarasam is interested in issuing a cryptocurrency, probably he can say Masura no Kahavo no. <laughs> Uh, which had been the traditional currency that had been used by our single kings. So you can go Masuran, crypto, Masuran, or Kahono crypto. Now, uh, we have come to a very uh, important point here. To summarize what I have said, we must always think that we know that central banks should be independent, but we must know there's a government which is sovereign, which is above us, and therefore we have to accede to their own demands. And when it comes to negotiating with the government, the former uh, first Silanese governor of the central bank, the late Mr. New Javadana, he said, 
central bank should nag the government like a good wife until such time the government accepts the central bank's view so it's a relationship between a husband and a wife but i might amend it a good wife is not good for the central bank today because we know a good wife yield into the demands of the husband will run the risk of getting pregnant every year <laughs> it must be a smart wife who would at least be able to have a gap between the pregnancies <laughs> so this is the choice for us today we have to work with the government we cannot be totally independent from the government is the role of functioning as a smart wife and that's the role of the monetary board and the governor of the central bank thank you